Miami has won the toss and will receive. Deep for the Dolphins, number 13, Jake Scott, and number 22, Mercury Morris. Let's get it, let's go! Let's go, Mercury! Get on the win, man. Get on the win. Come on, baby. Get on the win. What had begun like a dream ended as a nightmare. In the muck admire the Oakland Coliseum, the Miami Dolphins' determined climb to the top came to an end. A season full of accomplishment and pride ended as the Raiders stopped the Dolphins in an AFC playoff game. The defeat was a sad ending to a remarkable success story. But the incredible tale of the Miami Dolphins started long ago. Since their beginning, the Dolphins have been a young, exciting team, and the 1969 edition was no exception. Unfortunately, their youth often meant mistakes. The talent was there, the victories were not. The Dolphins had the worst record in the AFL in 1969. It was a year of frustration, a year of pain. In 1970, Don Schuler became the Dolphins' head coach but he was only part of the new look. A series of shrewd acquisitions brought the Dolphins talented veterans like tight end Marv Fleming, receiver Willie Richardson, and a free agent kicker, Garo Yapremian. But in the sharpest deal of all, Miami picked up Paul Warfield. Smooth, fast, and agile, Warfield added instant explosiveness to the Dolphins' offense. In Miami, 1970 became a year of excitement as Dolphin fans were treated to a dazzling display of football talent. With Don Shula, new players, and an improved attitude, 1970 was the year of the new look, the new season, the new era. After losing to Boston, the Miami win streak began in Houston, where the Oilers' Charlie Johnson was first to notice the Dolphins' improvement. A rugged defense and a ball control offense were Don Shula's two main goals. Both were apparent. And touchdowns by rookie Jim Mandich and Howard Twilley gave Miami a 20-10 victory. Although a victory over Houston was impressive, the Dolphins' first big test came against Oakland, a team Miami had never beaten. Despite a near hurricane, 
the Dolphins' young defense wiped out Oakland's renowned offense. In spite of the slippery field, Bob Greasy and Paul Warfield flashed early evidence of their big play potential. By himself, Warfield is a potent weapon, but paired with Bob Greasy, the combination is unstoppable. For the first time in their history, Miami beat the Raiders. But there was little time for joy as they ran head-on into the New York Jets, another team the Dolphins had never beaten in their five-year existence. But the spell the Jets had cast ended because this was 1970, and these were the new-look Dolphins. Once more, it was the combination of Greasy to Warfield that caused the real damage. Warfield left defenders stumbling in his wake as he slithered in and out of the Jets' secondary. When Greasy and Warfield had completed their magic act, the result was a 20-6 Miami victory. Broadway Joe and the Jets had been the third opponent to discover that the former doormats from Miami had become contenders. In Buffalo, the Dolphins won their fourth straight, 33 to 14. Although the offense had received most of the publicity, a shored up defense had been the backbone of all the victories. Number 40, Dick Anderson, led a stingy secondary that often gave Miami good scoring position. And when you have a pair like Greasy to Warfield, that's the ball game. Paul Warfield had become all Miami had hoped for. A swift, graceful wide receiver capable of exploding for the big play. Every fake, sharp and precise. Every catch, a breathtaking picture. Every touchdown, a monument of self-expression. Warfield added excitement and explosiveness to the offense, and the result had been victories. But suddenly, the ugly face of defeat appeared. Paul Warfield watched in disbelief as his former teammates from Cleveland snapped the Dolphins' win streak 28 to nothing. The next week, Don Shula made a homecoming trip to Baltimore, but had the door slammed in his face 35 to nothing. Then in Philadelphia, the Dolphins hit bottom as they fell before the lowly Eagles 24 to 17. The once powerful passing game had become anemic and ineffective. The cohesive team effort that had marked the first four victories was mysteriously absent. It was a time of frustration and confusion, a time when no one was sure what was happening. Everything seemed to go wrong at once, and even the ball seemed to take the wrong bounce. The joy of victory had vanished, and the agony of defeat had appeared. Miami was at the crossroads. Every player had to summon up new courage and determination to revive the winning spirit. Then, in the ninth game of the season against New Orleans, the winning spirit returned. It was there in the determined effort of Willie Richardson. It was there in the renewed vigor of a defensive back like Lloyd Mumford, number 26. And it was there in the clutch receiving of a versatile back like Jim Kick, number 21.
the winning spirit, the effort, the determination, but particularly the pride that had marked the Dolphins' win streak had suddenly reappeared. Miami rolled over the Saints 21 to 10. But the most important occurrence was the return to form of Bob Greasy. Greasy hit on 15 of 19 passes and was named the NFL's back of the week. After having been in a slump, the magic talents of Bob Greasy were back. Greasy is an essential element in the Miami attack, and as he goes, so go the Dolphins. When he shines, Miami wins. When he doesn't, they lose. It's as simple as that. Bob Greasy is a one-man circus, an escape artist in shoulder pads, a high-wire performer who scrambles along a tight rope of danger, a gambler who flirts with disaster and comes up a winner. He is a born entertainer, but Bob Greasy is also a leader. His scrambling is unmatched but it is as a passer that Greasy has developed. Running or throwing, through winning and losing, Bob Greasy had become a pro. The tenth game of the season was the big one, a rematch with the Baltimore Colts, who were riding high in first place in the AFC East. The two teams met before in Baltimore, where the Colts beat Miami 35 to nothing, and painful memories of the first Colts game still lingered with Miami. Don Shula recalled how Baltimore kick returners had breezed through the Dolphin defense for easy scores. Bob Greasy remembered how a master named Unitas had taught him a few strokes in the art of quarterbacking. In the first meeting, Miami had been shut out, and every man recalled the embarrassment of the final score. But now, this was Miami, the Orange Bowl, and the Dolphins were going to prove they were winners. They proved it by the play calling and running of quarterback Bob Greasy. They proved it with the passing of Greasy to Paul Warfield. The Dolphins showed they were winners as 40 men exerted an all-out effort for 60 minutes. They were the new-look Dolphins, but even an original Dolphin like number 89, called Noonan, made a valuable contribution. But the play that broke the game open was a 77-yard punt return by rookie Jake Scott, number 13. The 34-17 victory was the greatest win in Miami's five-year history. For Don Shula, it was sweet revenge over his old team. And although they didn't know it at the time, Miami had defeated the eventual world champions. Miami's sixth victory took place in Atlanta before a national television audience. 
All season long, the kick returning of number 13, Jake Scott, and Mercury Morris had been instrumental in giving the Dolphins strategic field position. From there, the bull backfield of number 39, Larry Zonka and Jim Kick took over. This formula resulted in a 20 to seven Miami victory. Power is their password, touchdowns their result. Jim Kick and Larry Zonka. Larry Zonka's method is that of a steamroller. Basic, brutal power. By using his forearm as a bludgeon, Zonka clubs down any would-be tacklers. And this technique made him the second leading runner in the AFC. Jim Kick, a wild and woolly cowboy from Wyoming. While Kick is an exceptional runner, versatility is his hallmark. He can catch as well as run and was the only player in the conference to appear in the top 10 in both categories. Kick and Zonka gave the Dolphins a double-barreled power weapon that was complemented by the sheer speed of Eugene Mercury Morris. run is a weaving, twisting adventure through a field of danger, a swashbuckling journey goalward through a maze of tacklers. Mercury Morris possesses a reservoir of talent that has not yet been fully realized. He is blessed with blazing speed that makes him a threat each time he touches the ball. But Mercury gets upset when he doesn't go all the way every time. Mercury's chance came against Boston in the season's 12th game when he rocketed it 96 yards with the opening kickoff. Against Boston, Miami scored just about every way possible. If it wasn't a Morris touchdown, it was the return of a blocked kick by number 26, Lloyd Mumford. As in all the victories, the 37 to 20 Miami win relied on the clutch kicking of Garrow Yapremian. The victory was a polished professional effort and the Dolphins even tried a little deception. While the well-proportioned scatback received attention from the press, Boston's Joe Cap received attention from the Miami defense. With their fourth win in a row and their eighth of the season, the Dolphins were hitting their peak, and much of the credit went to the defense. The improved Miami defense was the result of the enthusiasm of youngsters like rookie Jake Scott, number 13, and second-year man Bill Stanford. The improvement of a rookie like number 57, Mike Colon. The maturity and experience of a Nick Bonoconte, and the development of two defensive tackles like John Richardson and Manny Fernandez. 
They were 11 angry men. Mayhem's marauders. The Havoc Machine. Miami defense allowed fewer points than any team in the conference. And it was the secondary that made a big contribution. Number 40, Dick Anderson, has become a slick pass thief who knows how to run with the ball, but that's not how he earned his nickname, the Sticker. A big surprise in the secondary was Jake Scott, number 13. A former All-American from Georgia who played one year in Canada, Scott became an instant star. He is a deft pass dealer with breakaway speed, and he became doubly valuable to the Dolphins as a kick returner. The development of a coordinated defense was just one more phase in the evolution of a winner. The New York Jets flew into Miami intent on avenging an early season defeat. But Super Bowl thoughts already had started to enter the Dolphins' minds. Number 81, Howard Twilley, another original Dolphin, provided some clutch receiving. And with a playoff berth in mind, Miami decided to polish up a few new maneuvers. But old familiar tactics worked just as well. And another strong defensive effort, combined with three Garo Yapremian field goals, gave Miami a 16 to 10 victory. In previous years, Miami had never beaten New York. In 1970, they did it twice. All that stood between the Dolphins and the playoffs was a battle with the troublesome Buffalo Bills. Over 70,000 fans jammed the Orange Bowl to watch Miami's quest for its 10th regular season victory and a slot in the AFC playoffs. Jim Kick slammed over for three touchdowns as the Dolphins racked up their highest point total in history en route to their sixth straight win. The 45 to seven win gave Miami a 10 and four record, the best of any second place team in the conference and sent the Dolphins into the playoffs. The victory capped a season full of achievement for the Dolphins. Although they lost in the playoffs, Miami had seen the development of a winning tradition that was felt by everyone. From a proud coach named Don Shula, to a star like Bob Greasy on down to an unsung hero like guard Larry Little. After four years of losing, Miami had its first winning season, and attendance at home games almost doubled. Don Shula was named Coach of the Year. But the gold and glory have only begun as the future holds greater rewards. A season ticket is an entree to a world of glamour and excitement, for the new-look Dolphins of 1970 have just entered a new era of fame and accomplishment. 